Well, hello there, GCSE historians. It's Mr. Sissons here from Pegasus Academy. My role today is to take you through your very first live lesson for history, and that will be on the topic of medicine through time, public health and medicine, and you will be revising that over the next few weeks. Uh, at different times, you're going to hear different voices on this PowerPoint. Uh, this week, you've got me, but you're going to hear our colleagues as well from across the mat. Okay, just to get us started, I'll just take you through some information. This is the very first session to help you revise the first unit, Public Health and Medicine Free Time. Now, if you follow the PowerPoint carefully, we promise it's going to help you to revise the core content, uh, to develop your hinterland wider knowledge of medicine, and also to help improve your ability to write good exam answers to get top marks. Now, if you can download this PowerPoint, there will be sections that you'll be able to make notes on, and that would be a really good idea if you can do that, because it will help you with any future revision work that you do in year 10 or in year 11. Now the notes in the PowerPoint have been summarized, we've got the key bits for you, but you'll notice there's also other opportunities throughout the PowerPoint for you to go on and do extra research to improve your specific and detailed knowledge. Now if you want to send us the PowerPoint or any other notes that you make, uh, either via show my homework or email, that's brilliant, that's okay, and we're happy to check them. Uh, and just make sure you put your name on it and therefore we'll be able to know whose that work is. Now good luck with the rest of the work, and that's from the history departments across the mats. Okay, just to get started, this is our introduction slide. You can see it's our very first lesson on medieval medicine. So we're going to have an introduction to that today. We're actually going to focus on three themes. Ideas, approaches to medicine, and also some of the treatments that were being used at the time. You can notice that we've got some progress indicators. So for good progress, if you can identify, describe some of the key areas of medicine and change in medieval medicine, that would be good. And we're going to also have a look at a eight mark GCSE question uh, at the end of the session. Outstanding progress, assess which factors have created the most change. Remember, we want that specific knowledge, that uh, detailed knowledge with key words, key names, uh, but also a complete, uh, developed GCSE answer under time conditions. Now, that's something we'll talk about at the end. Now I'll just take you through some information you can see at the bottom of the screen. Now it says post-it note section. Now throughout this PowerPoint there are sections where you'll see it says your notes. So where you see a post-it note, that's where we're looking for you to make your own notes about what you're learning and about any more research you go on to do. And you can do that straight into the PowerPoint as we said before, or you can do it onto paper. There'll be some video clips throughout the lesson. Now if you're watching this on YouTube, you're not able to actually click on these video links. So what I'll ask you to do then, and I'll give you plenty of notice, is just to pause the lesson, then go back to show my homework, copy across the links that you can find there, watch the videos in a separate window, and then you can come back to the live lesson. And finally, you can see on the bottom corner information about the revision guide. Some of you may have this already. So if you do have that, there'll be some pages for you to have a look at as you go through it. Okay, to get started, let's move on. Okay, so this is your do now activity. Just to get warmed up, please use it as an opportunity to uh, think about anything you might remember from your medieval medicine work when you did it the first time around. You see there's a picture on the right hand side of the screen. Um, all we want you to do is to start to think about what this suggests about what people thought during medieval times, uh, why they were thinking what they were doing, and also the sorts of things they were then getting up to as part of their uh, approach to medicine. If you're watching this on the YouTube, uh, then please pause the video now in order to make your notes. Okay, so hopefully you've come back now. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna look through some of the things you may have picked out. Now, I'm not able to actually write on this version of PowerPoint, so I'm just having to bring up that box there in order to cheat a little bit. But the things you could have looked at were the people, and we can tell that they are religious, they are monks, and that is because of the way that they are dressed. You can maybe see their uh, slightly different haircuts, and this is making the connection between uh, religion and medicine, between the Christian church in particular and uh, what was happening in medieval medicine, which we'll explore later. We focus on the person sitting down, the patient. Uh, we can see he's looking up. It looks like he might be uh, looking at the heavens. And again, it's making that link to God and illness. Uh, many people thought that God was responsible for uh, their disease, for being unwell. But they also thought their solution um, would be found in God as well. So prayer was very important. We also uh, noticed that he's wide awake, his eyes are open. 
and that will show us as well about how uh, surgery and medicine was performed very differently. And there was no way of putting people to sleep, there was no real good pain relief, surgery was very difficult, uh, wasn't very nice, very painful. And then, you know, just to emphasize that, let's focus in on the knife in the picture. Uh, we don't know what he's going to do with that knife, but we assume it's going to be something with that gentleman's head. Again, just showing us how um, medieval medicine was often quite violent, it's very bloody and very different from today. Okay, now we're going to move on to uh, the next slide. Okay, session one. So there will be two sessions. Session one is the revision session. And what we're going to revise are ideas, approaches and treatments. What ideas did medieval people have? What approaches did they take? And what treatments did they do in medicine? Okay, now we come to the time that you're going to watch your very first video. Remember when you do this, if you're watching on YouTube, you need to pause the live lesson, go back to show my homework, copy the web link, paste this into another window, watch the video and make some notes, and then you can come back to your live lesson. This video is from BBC Teach. It's a very good introduction to medieval um, medicine and also in particular to the ideas that medieval people had and why. Three questions we want you to do. When was the medieval period? Uh, what did people think caused disease? And where did their ideas come from? So you can now pause the lesson and I'll see you uh, in a few moments. You can stop the lesson. Okay, welcome back. Um, hopefully that was successful. Now I'm going to pull up a few things just to help us here. So in answer to the first question, when was the medieval period? Well, the medieval period was a very long period from 500 AD to 1500 AD. So about 500 years ago, stretching back another thousand years from that. Now you can divide this period up into the Dark Ages. Uh, the video mentioned how that was when uh, medieval ideas kind of stopped. Um, they went backwards. Some of these uh, approaches linked to some key people we're going to look at got forgotten about. And then the period we're really mostly interested in, which is the Middle Ages, uh, from 1000 AD to 1500 AD. So we're going back 500 to 1000 years ago. We're now going to focus on the other uh, questions in particular. What did people think and where did their ideas come from? To do that, we're going to look at two people from your video. And we're going to see them in the next slide. I'll move on to it now. Okay, here we come to two people who were mentioned in the BBC Teach video. They are Hippocrates and Galen. Now, these uh, gentlemen were alive a long time before medieval times, but they're important because their ideas, their approaches to medicine, continued to influence what people believed, and what people did for a long time after their deaths. So we're going to quickly start with Hippocrates. And Hippocrates is important because he basically um, broke the mould he wasn't uh, looking at gods and he wasn't uh, looking at superstition to try and explain what was going on when people were unwell. Instead, he looked to nature. He looked to nature for reasons for why people were sick and he looked to nature for what you might do about it, for the treatments you might use. And this led on to a really big idea, so important for this topic, which is the idea of the four humours. And this is the idea that the body is made up of four humours or liquids. In fact, Hippocrates would say that the whole of nature was made up of four parts as well. And I'm going to bring up a little diagram here for the body. So the four liquids that the body was made up of was blood, black bile, yellow bile and phlegm. We can also look at things that were hot, dry, wet and cold. And his big idea was that when you're unwell, it's because there was a problem in one of those four liquids. There was an imbalance in the liquids. You either had too much of one liquid or not enough. Now the four humours, really important idea when it comes to what medieval people generally thought about the body and how you should go about treating the problems that people had. Very quickly, let's look at some other things for Hippocrates. There we go. There's the Hippocratic Oath. And this is something where doctors would swear to prioritise patients, to uh, focus on the health of their patients above making money. And just to uh, point out the importance of this, even today in the NHS, that's what doctors swear. That is something so important we focus on our patients, we put our lives sometimes um, behind the lives of the patients, they're the most important things, 
shows the influence of Hippocrates to medicine even today. And also there was the Hippocratic Collection, which was a, a detailed list that he put together of symptoms he identified and different treatments for different illnesses and conditions. And just the fact that he was doing that, he was encouraging others to record their uh, observations and what they were doing. He thought that the more notes, the more collection of information, the more that other doctors in the future could improve what they were doing for their patients. And this helps us to make a connection to Galen. Now Galen uh, was also born in Greece, just like Hippocrates, but actually he lived during the time of the Roman Empire and he went to live in Rome, so he's often associated with the Romans. Now, when it comes to Galen, first thing we can say is that Galen, uh, he had read uh, Hippocrates, he knew about the work of Hippocrates, and he believed in the work of Hippocrates. It's really important. He was a big believer in the four humours, and that influenced what Galen did and how Galen went about uh, his work. The key idea, though, that Galen came up with was the treatment of the opposites. Now, this is linked to the four humours. It's linked to the idea that when you're unwell, there's a problem in one of those liquids, and what Galen says is you need to identify where the problem is and you treat it with the opposite. So if someone is too hot, you treat it with something cold. If someone is too cold, well, you treat it with something hot. In the example on the screen here, it says if you have a cold, give the person who's unwell something hot to warm them up, restore the balance in their humours, for example, make them eat a fiery pepper. Now, moving on from Galen, a few other things we can just point out. Uh, Galen oh, is linked to the Christian Church so this is so important as well it's something we'll have a look about in um, session two uh, next week but when we look at Galen his ideas about the body about health uh, were taken on board by the Christian Church that became very powerful in medieval times throughout Europe and in Britain and basically the ideas that Galen had was the ideas that the church believed in and this basically influenced what everybody who was involved in medicine uh, was learning about. And that just uh, emphasises how Galen continued to be important for a long time. Uh, nearly one and a half thousand years after he died, uh, Galen was a really important figure in terms of what people believed and what people did when it came to medicine. And one example of something that Galen did specifically is that he proved that the brain controls speech for an experiment he did on a pig. He did like to do his experiments on animals, we'll come back to that later. Um, now before that people believed that the body was actually controlled by the heart and Galen was uh, the gentleman who proved that it was not. Okay, we're now going to move on to something else. Okay, moving on from the work of Hippocrates and Galen and the key ideas that are linked to those two men, we're now going to move from ideas to approaches and in particular we're going to focus on medieval doctors. You see in the bottom corner of the page there that there's a box saying further reading. Just a reminder that if you do want to carry on your research, uh, find out even more than we go through today, uh, there are places that you can look for, uh, web links, uh, pages in the revision guide that you might want to check out. Now coming back to the doctors, and we can see a picture of a doctor there. So let's just start with the key point. The doctors of medieval times believed in the work of Hippocrates, they believed in the four humours, uh, they'd studied Galen, and they believed in his treatment of the opposites. What that basically means was, if you were unwell, they thought there was an imbalance in your body. And what that shows us about doctors in medieval times is their knowledge to what doctors have today, completely different. There was no knowledge of what was really causing disease, or what was really spreading illnesses about. No one knew about germs. It would be hundreds and hundreds of years before germs would be identified. And what this meant was that doctors saw the world very differently. Uh, they believed in the four humours, but they also were religious. They were Christians, and that meant that they saw a role for God in illness, and that God had a role to play in either why someone was unwell, they might be, God might be punishing them for their wrongdoings, but also in how we might approach treating people, such as praying. A key idea, though, that many people, particularly medieval doctors, believed in at the time was the idea of miasma. Now, miasma is the idea that smell, bad smell, is the cause of disease and is spreading disease around. Now that's not that crazy because often we associate smells with ill people, it, it, it's just a fact. However, what medieval doctors thought was the smell itself was spreading the illness around. It was the cause of the illness. Now that is miasma. So moving on with a little bit more specific knowledge about medieval doctors, 
Well, doctors went to university. They were actually well trained. They studied for seven years. But these universities were very different to the ones that we have today. They were run by the church. What that meant was they only learnt the sorts of things that the church wanted them to learn, pretty much the ideas of Galen. And the church banned dissection, which meant that they weren't able to do any studies on the body themselves. Occasionally they might see somebody doing this, but these uh, university trained doctors never practiced on any patients, never tried anything else, anything out. It was pretty much book learning. Um, the work of Galen. What we've got on the screen there is actually the name of another book, Gilbert Eagle's Compendium of Medicine. That would be a great example, an exam question, nice specific fact there. Uh, but we're making the point that these doctors are learning from books. Moving ourselves on, we'll now look specifically at the picture and we can see the doctor is holding a flask and it's got a liquid in it. And that's because one of the best ways a medieval doctor would identify what was wrong with you would be by looking at your urine, your wee. And now they might uh, look at the colour of it, uh, they might even smell it, they might even taste it, but that's how they were going to identify what was going wrong in your four humours. Uh, they might also look at uh, planets and stars and astrology charts. They might check your pulse, but uh, urine had a key role to play in identifying what was wrong with you. Now, the last couple of points we'll just say about uh, medieval doctors is they were expensive. Very few people actually consulted with them because they couldn't afford to. If you were a villager or a peasant, this wasn't somebody you would go to. Instead, you would go and see maybe somebody in your village, like a wise woman, somebody who's been around for a while, somebody who might have a knowledge of plants and might be able to make you up some form of herbal medicine. Apothecaries also did that as well, uh, but you would have to possibly pay them a little bit more money and they were often linked to medieval doctors. OK, we're now going to move on and have a look at treatments. When it comes to looking at the treatments that doctors use, we're quickly going to have a look at just some big ones. Here we go, bloodletting. Linked to the four humours, very important. Also called purging. If there was something wrong with the balance of your humours, maybe you've got too much blood. Solution, we're going to bleed the patient. We might make little cuts. We might use leeches. Now, that would be worm-like creatures that would suck the blood out. Now, bloodletting was a treatment that was used for lots of different problems and it was a treatment that went on for hundreds and hundreds of years. We've also got the treatment of tree panning and this would be linked more to religion and the idea being that you might have a evil spirit in your head that was causing you to have a problem like a headache or other difficulties you were suffering from. Solution, we're going to get that spirit out, we're going to drill a hole in your head to allow the evil spirit out. And then finally, cauterization. Now, cauterization was the use of hot oil or a hot iron to try and close a wound or uh, to seal a wound. And in the picture that we're showing you, we're actually showing uh, the use of a hot iron to help reduce uh, hemorrhoids, something uh, very painful. Okay, now we come to the second occasion. You're going to be asked to watch some video clips and to make some notes. So just a reminder, if you're watching this in YouTube, you're going to need to pause the live lesson, go back to show my homework to find the web links, copy them into a separate window, watch the videos before you then return to the live lesson. Uh, the focus is on doctors again. Um, we're just going to ask you to try and develop your knowledge of doctors. And we're looking at how were doctors trained in the medieval ages and how did doctors treat people in the medieval ages. Uh, so you can now pause this live lesson now okay welcome back um, we don't really have time to go into too much detail in those videos but if you have watched them you're going to have picked up some fantastic knowledge there um, you would have picked up a few focuses not just on doctors though but on a few things I've just brought up on the screen now barber surgeons the role of women and the role of church in medieval medicine now particularly the role of the Christian church is something we're going to come back to next week but we're now going to focus on barber surgeons and we're going to move on to that now as the very last part of session one of this first lesson. OK, and here he is, the barber surgeon. Uh, so our focus to end of session one is on medieval surgery. So we've been looking at the ideas of medieval people, we've been looking at some of the approaches they took to medicine and we've been looking at the treatments and medieval surgery fits into what we've been looking at. So the very first thing we want to say about barber surgeons is that they were people of their time. 
just like the doctors that we've already looked at, they also would be aware of the ideas of Galen and this would be something that they believed in. Uh, what this shows is, just like the doctors, they didn't really know much about how the human body really was. Remember that Galen had been performing dissections on animals, you know, apes, uh, dogs, and that is how he'd worked out what he thought the human body was like. In fact, he actually made many mistakes. Uh, so the barber surgeons themselves also had a limited knowledge of what actually was going on in the human body and what was really uh, the way to fix things in the human body. And what that meant was that barber surgeons could only perform very basic surgery. Now remember these barber surgeons are really barbers. Um, they're not like doctors, they haven't been to university, they haven't been trained. Um, in fact they've um, kind of learnt their skills maybe from barber surgeons around them, other barber surgeons, they've picked up their ideas. The only reason that they're really performing surgery is that they've got the equipment, the tools to do it and there's a gap in the market and it's a way of them making some money at the time, some additional money. Now uh, barber surgeons are doing surgery because they're cheaper than doctors. Um, but as I've said they're not very well trained and what that meant was they would perform only a limited amount of surgeries uh, quick surgeries, fast surgeries, stuff like amputation when you're basically cutting part of the body off maybe things like tooth extractions uh, things like that uh, and there's a reason why they're going to be fast and that is because of the danger of blood loss they spend too long the patient's going to lose too much blood and that would be a big killer some other killers that we need to look at here are the fact that this would be very painful surgery. There was no good painkillers, there was no anaesthetics, uh, no way of putting the patient to sleep during these operations. And what that basically meant was there was a big risk that people could die of shock uh, from uh, this surgery performed by the barber surgeon. And there was some natural substances that were being tried uh, during medieval times that did have a, an impact, did limit some of the pain, but they were not very reliable, you couldn't trust them. There were things like mandrake root, and also opium. Now opium was linked to a British uh, surgeon called John of Ardeen who um, was a barber surgeon during war uh, and basically started to experiment and use different things around him and found that opium was actually something that was helping uh, people to limit the pain they were uh, suffering from. And then uh, another big killer, infection. And this is happening because of the lack of knowledge. So barber surgeons had no idea about the role of germs, just like nobody in medieval times had uh, any knowledge of germs. Hundreds of years before people knew about germs. And as a result of that, uh, they didn't clean the tools they were using, they didn't clean the clothes they were wearing, uh, they didn't clean the rooms they were doing these operations in. And basically many people, uh, if they didn't die from the shock or the blood loss uh, from the surgery, uh, they could easily die from an infection afterwards. And just a reminder uh, that when it came to closing up the wounds that they caused, uh, barber surgeons would be cauterizing. They would be using hot irons, hot oil, to basically try and stop bleeding and to close that wound. Again, very, very painful. Okay, uh, to finish off with, uh, we're just going to ask you a couple of quick quiz questions. Uh, if you were in class, you might vote with your fingers here. But all we're going to ask you to do here is to listen to the options for the questions. Uh, pause the live lesson, see if you can decide which of the two correct statements before starting the live lesson again and then seeing uh, what the correct answers are. Okay, Question one is about Hippocrates, very important during this time period. So which two of these statements are true about Hippocrates? Is it one, he lived in medieval England, two, he came up with the four humours idea of the body, three, he was a Christian, or four, he came up with the Hippocratic Oath that doctors still use today. Okay, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, pause your live lesson now. Okay, welcome back. And now we'll just go for the answers. Well, the correct answers here are, he came up with the four humours idea of the body, and he came up with the Hippocratic Oath that doctors still use today. Remember, the four humours idea that the body's made up of four liquids is so important for medieval beliefs because he comes up with this idea that you're unwell because there's a problem in one of those liquids, there's an imbalance. Now let's look at the wrong answers. He lived in medieval England, well he didn't, he was from Greece, plus he was alive thousands of years before medieval times, and he was a Christian, again, Christianity didn't exist at this time, he, he was a Greek, he believed in the Greek gods, but remember he has a big influence on the Christian church and what medieval people thought. 
Okay, which two of these statements are true about Galen? Number one, he was a Roman. Number two, he dissected a lot of human bodies to improve medical knowledge. Number three, Galen was a Christian. And number four, he came up with the idea of the treatment of the opposites. So once again, make your decision now. And if you need to, pause the lesson to give yourself some time. Okay, I'm back and I'll take you through the answers. So the correct answers this time are one and four. It's a bit of a cheat, number one, really, because he was a Greek, but he went to live in Rome, became a Roman citizen. Uh, and then the big idea for Galen is he came up with the idea of the treatment of the opposites. That whatever's wrong in the four humours, you treat it by going to the opposite humour. You're too hot, use something cold. You're too cold, use something hot. Let's just explore the other answers. Remember, he's born before. Even though he's born after Jesus Christ, he's not a Christian, he's in Rome, there's the Roman God still. But remember, he's going to be connected to the Christian church because the Christian church is going to find in Galen ideas they like about the human body, about how great it is, about what a unique creation it is, and it must have been caused by God. And finally, um, he dissected a lot of human bodies. Well, he did do dissections. He did write a lot about what the human body was, but he was actually basing this on his dissections of animals. Later on, the Christian church, they're going to ban the dissection of human beings, and that's going to hold back the learning of what the human body really is like. Okay, final question. Okay, the final recap question is, which of these statements is true about medieval doctors and barber surgeons? Number one, going to see a doctor was free. Number two, surgery was dangerous due to blood loss, shock, and infection. Number three, doctors learn about medicine through dissections. And number four, doctors learn by using books and not by practicing on actual patients. So once again, think about what you want to choose and pause the live lesson now. And I'm back and I can tell you the answers this time are number two, surgery was dangerous due to blood loss, shock and infection. And number four, doctors learn by using books and not by practicing. So just a reminder that um, doctors didn't get to perform any sort of practice on patients. It's pretty much learning about the work of Galen and definitely doctors were expensive. So number one was not correct. Very few people could afford to go to the doctors. So that brings us to the end of uh, this first session. However, if you continue with the live lesson, we're going to go on to session two and we're just going to explain about the work you need to do to follow up this lesson. And there's that that is linked to an exam question and that will be something that we'll go on to now. So session two is actually something that you don't need to do straight away with the live lesson. Session two is linked to some more resources that have been loaded up for you as well. And that is a medieval medicine um, sort of revision book. It's, it's a quiz book, got some exam questions in that. So the work for the exam uh, question is due at the end of the week. And remember that is what you need to submit. That's your evidence of doing your work. And that's the most important thing. That's where you're trying out what you've learnt, uh, and your teachers can give you some uh, real quality feedback and really help you to uh, really improve, you know, do a few exam questions, you're gonna get much better at the topic. Uh, there you can see a copy of the booklet. So remember, you don't have to do this right now, um, but let me just take you through how you might go about doing the exam question. And remember, you can come back to this, come back to these slides if you need some help. So uh, the work in the booklet for each week will always have a quiz. So you can see these uh, eight quiz questions there. They're just meant to be uh, some quick fire questions. We're gonna give you the answers to this at the next week's PowerPoint. So we'll always give the answers the week after the work that you've done. If you did this live lesson on a Monday, maybe come back to do the exam question on a Wednesday. So have a go at this, it doesn't take long. What have you remembered? Need to go back to your notes. On to the exam question. So the very first exam question that we're gonna be doing for medieval medicine is what's called a significance question. So as you can see, it says here that the structure of a significance question is to try and write uh, a couple of paragraphs on at least two points of significance. And these points need to be different. So I'm gonna show you uh, an example answer soon, but what that really means is you've got to try and talk about how someone's importance, their significance changes. So what did they do maybe when they were alive? That's a, a nice focus. What did they do that was new? What did they find out? But then also, if you can, think about well, how did the importance of that change? Did this person become more important over time? Did they become less important over time? 
And you can see that's written down as the second paragraph there talking about long-term significance. Now it's really important during this answer, let me just bring up the question for you, that you uh, try and use specific knowledge. And by that I mean the key names, uh, statistics, you know, where you've got some numbers, a name of a book would be fantastic or a key idea. That's how you're going to show that you've really studied the topic. That's how you're going to get the marks of the examiners. From there, that's how you can explain and you can get yourself into the high advance. So our question is explain the significance of the work of Hippocrates and Galen in the advancement of medieval medicine. So really, we're going to write about two people here. We're going to write about what Hippocrates did, give some specific facts, try and explain why they were important, how they influenced medieval medicine, and then we'll repeat that for Galen. And remember, if we can talk about how importance changes over time, they become more or less important. Maybe they were important after they died. That would be a way of also getting higher marks. I'm just going to take you on to another slide. Okay, so here's a mark scheme, and it's out of eight. Uh, we've just showed you up to six marks. Now, if you can achieve four marks, you can see that's been highlighted in red. That's about half marks in this question. Well, you're pretty much a grade five response. You're on track for that grade five. And you'll notice in the level two description, it says specific knowledge, specific knowledge. Those key words, those key names, those statistics, uh, that's how you show that you've got specific knowledge. And then we do need some explanation. Something that says, maybe at the end of the paragraph you're writing, this was significant, this was important because this is what it was doing to medieval medicine. Now we go up to level three, you'll see it says, you're writing on at least two or three key areas. So that's when we might look at what's happening at the time, or we might look at what's happening in the long term after this person's died, maybe years afterwards, or if he's still important. We might focus specifically on what's happening in Britain. Um, in our first question though, we're lucky because we've got two people to write about. So actually we can just write about the importance of each person. That's our way of writing about two uh, different areas. Let's move on to the next slide. This is showing you how you might go about um, writing the significance answer. And this is something that you'll be able to look at within your book. This is actually on uh, page four of that uh, booklet that you can work on. And it's just a, a structure, a, a writing frame that can help you. And if you're going to answer a significant question, well, use that word significance in that first sentence. Yeah, this person's significant, they're important, or they're not. But then I know that. Back it up. Give you specific gaps, facts, sorry, give your evidence, explain what you know about this person. And at the end of it, well, this shows why this person, this event, is important, was not important because, and explain it. And that would be uh, producing a, a fantastic paragraph. I'm going to move this over once more. And now I'm going to just pop a few things into this. Here you go. So if we were writing for this question, explain the significance of the work of Hippocrates and Galen, well, this is how we might go about writing it. Pick a person. So let's pick Hippocrates. Hippocrates was significant in the development of medicine at the time of medieval medicine. So that's my first sentence. I've used the person's name. I've linked to the time period. I've used the keyword significant. I've got all that from the question. I'm using the question at the beginning of my answer, my beginning of my paragraph. I know that. And here I'm going to talk about Hippocrates. What was the name of his key idea? What does it actually mean? Could I describe this in a little bit more detail? Can I talk about why that made him important? Remember, both these men died way before medieval times, but they were still influencing what people were doing and what people believed in. And that's the argument that you want to make. OK, so that is your demonstrate task. That's what we're looking for you to do week one. And we're just going to show you one other thing now. Uh, hopefully it doesn't confuse you. We're just going to show you an example of a significance question from a later time period. This is about a person called William Harvey. So pretty much it's the same question, just about a different person. I'm just going to show you how it might look. Let's take you there. OK, so here's that question. Explain the significance of the work of Harvey for the development of medicine during the Renaissance. Different time period, different person, but the same question effectively. We're just looking at the significance of Hippocrates or Galen. I'm just going to bring this answer up now. OK, so this is just one paragraph from the answer. But it's a great paragraph. It's a paragraph that's going to get like four marks out of A. You know, it's a grade five response. Um, let's have a look at it. So Harvey was significant in the development of medicine at the time of the Renaissance, using significant in the first sentence, using the name of the person we're writing about, using the time period, 
perfect. I know that Harvey helped improve knowledge of human anatomy, that's the body, by undertaking 12 years of experiments, he came up with the idea of circulation. He wrote a book called Do More to Cardis in 1628, which showed how the heart pumped blood around the body and that the arteries took blood away from the heart and the veins back to it. We're just given some facts about Harvey and its specific knowledge. We've got a statistic in 12 years, we've got the name of a book, we've got a keyword circulation, and we've got some description of that. Now, if you were writing about Hippocrates, what would you write about? Well, we've got the idea of the four humans. We can then uh, go into more detail about what that actually means, describe it, um, and then what does it stand to do next? This shows why Harvey was important, as he proved how Galen had been wrong about the blood, and that it was not just reproduced after being used up as the body's fuel. Surgeons who read his book would get a better understanding of how the body worked and could use this to perform better surgery. Notice that even in this answer we're mentioning Galen, which shows how long people were reading Galen and believing in Galen, we've got this guy from a later time period who's having to challenge what Galen was about. So if you were writing about Hippocrates or Galen, same thing, yeah they were important during medieval times, and then this is what I know about them, this is their key idea, this is what this means, show off your knowledge of these people. Finally, a sentence at the end of the paragraph, now this shows why Hippocrates was important, this shows why Galen was important because and remember, these men died way before medieval times, but they continued to influence how doctors, how barber surgeons, just how medicine was done and the things that people thought about the body. OK, thanks very much for listening and good luck with the question. Hopefully we'll get some great answers in.